BDE, Big Dryad Energy. Oh, gosh. If we didn't title these about whatever the chapter was, that would be the title of this episode. <laughs> What's good? Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of The Newest Olympian. My name is Mike Schubert. I am the titular Newest Olympian. I never read the Percy Jackson series before. Now I'm reading it as a grown man, a 29-year-old boy. Here I am. But it is not just me talking about Chapter 7 of The Lightning Thief here with you all today. I am joined by Multitude's own, the host of Exolore. It's Dr. Moya McTeer. Dr. Moya, how is it going? It's going great. I've been looking forward to recording this episode for so long. I love this series. Tell me all about it. What is your history with the series, your love for the series? I was very pleasantly surprised how excited you were. I guess not surprised, but I was very pleasantly confirmed by, I bet this is exactly Moya's bag. And then you did confirm, this is exactly my thing. <laughs> yeah, you were absolutely spot on. You are the newest Olympian. I have been an Olympian since I was in seventh grade. Okay. Which was, what, 2000. Seven? I don't know when you were born, <laughs> but I know book one came out in 2005. <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah. So just like a year or two after it came out, I read this in seventh grade. I have a personal attachment to this series because I started dating my first boyfriend after we bonded over reading the Percy Jackson books. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be too touchy, but were things OK? Did you have a very bad Percy Jackson themed breakup? No, it was a very <laughs> amicable breakup. We broke Love up over that. the summer. You know, we were seventh graders, so it just kind of fizzled out. Oh. But we were doing a Greek mythology lesson in my social studies class. So I read Percy Jackson to supplement the reading and we just fell in love over discussions about Chiron and Mr. D, I guess. That's so fantastic. I love how flimsy the nature of seventh grade relationships are because there was a time that I was, you know, seventh grade dating someone and it was during the summer and it was the time in which I had a flip phone cell phone yeah, you did. and I was going to my aunt's place. She lives in Belmar, New Jersey, near the beach. I was going to my aunt's place for the weekend and I forgot to bring my phone charger. <gasps> so my phone died over the course of Friday and then I wasn't able to text my girlfriend, oh no, my phone is dead. I can't talk to you this whole weekend. And when I got back on Monday and plugged in my phone, I had a voicemail from her that said, I want to break up. We don't talk anymore. <laughs> <laughs> because we didn't talk for two days. <laughs> the standards are high in seventh grade relationships. You got to be on it all the time. Totally. Well, I found out the truth behind it because my buddy Chris, bless his heart, he wanted to cheer me up and said, hey, let's go to a movie. So we probably saw something that came out in the year 2005. I don't know, Mr. and Mrs. Smith. We saw that in the movie theater. And at the movie theater, I saw my now ex-girlfriend with some other dude. <gasps> so... <laughs> She moved on so fast. Maybe we never talk anymore was just a convenient excuse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she was looking for that. I know. Well, such is seventh grade relationships. What are you going to do? But we are here, speaking of the number seven, to talk about chapter seven, which, keeping with the incredible theme of unbelievably perfect chapter titles, this one is called My Dinner Goes Up in Smoke, which isn't as outlandish as some of the other chapter titles. But for me, if anyone has ever seen me eat... I eat so much food. <laughs> I have a very active metabolism, which is a great problem to have. I am not trying to say, oh, woe is me. I can eat a lot of food and still keep a, a nice thin boy figure. But it does require that I eat a lot of snacks throughout the day. And when I worked in a normal office setting, my coworkers would be very alarmed that I would have a snack every hour on the hour, like yogurt cup, peanut butter and jelly sandwich, bag of almonds, banana, orange, apple, baby carrots and hummus. That's all in one day? I'm not exaggerating. Oh, my God. <laughs> so the prospect of having plans for dinner and then not getting to eat dinner, mm. that struck a nerve with me. Yeah, that sounds like a nightmare. It's just there's nothing worse than having a really exciting dinner that you're looking forward to, like Percy is here, and then something coming in and throwing it all amiss. Just devastation. I love how... You've talked about this before. The chapter titles are misleading but truthful. And they're kind of like prophecies in that way, which I mm. love because, you know, this book has some prophecies. Yes. 
to contextualize why you are a perfect guest here, can you explain just for the listener your folklore mythology background for everyone so people can understand? Wow, I should be very impressed with Dr. Moya McTeer. <laughs> sure. I studied folklore and mythology in college. I actually double majored in folklore and astrophysics, which was a fun and very busy double major to do. But I grew up reading myths. I love Greek myths, not as much as I love Norse and Celtic myths. That's where my heart truly lies. But I grew up reading all the stories. I loved the Percy Jackson books. I took a class specifically on Greek mythology in college, embedded within my more general folklore classes. Yeah, I'm a myth nerd. Amazing. Needless to say, I alluded to in earlier episodes that we would have a Greek mythological correspondent. Ah! Me. The cat is out of the bag. It is Dr. Moya. So there will be future episodes. I'm thinking in between books, maybe we do some episodes kind of recapping the mythology, because I feel like if you were telling me stuff in the moment, it would kind of spoil it a little bit. Oh, yeah. Some of the joy of the story is if I do know the mythology, cool. But I think part of the fun is Rick tells you enough where you can get by. So I think it would be more fun for us to talk about past stuff. So if there's anything we've already covered that you want to go deeper into, sure, or in this chapter, great. But I think we have separate dedicated episodes to talk about all the mythological elements of the book, the folks we met along the way. And I think that could be very fun interstitial in between books, in between series episodes. Yeah, I agree. I love that. Amazing. Great. Thank you for confirming my idea. This is great. <laughs> now that you've given me a compliment, we can move on <laughs> to covering chapter seven of Percy Jackson, The Lightning Thief. Okay. So where we last left off, Percy had become supreme lord of the bathroom and <laughs> had defeated Clarice in her attempt to swirly him. Much like any sort of camp among middle schoolers, word of this spreads immediately. Everybody knows. It is the talk of the town. Annabeth continues to show Percy around. And at one point, they go by the metal shop where kids forge swords. They also go by an arts and crafts room where satyrs are sandblasting a giant marble statue of a goat man, which... I love. And then there is a climbing wall, which I'm already a little scared of climbing walls, even when you're fully harnessed in and everything. Mm -hmm. But this climbing wall has two walls that shake, drop boulders, spray lava, and clash together if you don't get to the top fast enough? What is the mortality rate at Camp Half-Blood? I need to know. I have like 80% of them have to be from this climbing wall. I have no idea. Maybe they've just got so much ambrosia and nectar on deck. Maybe they have a really good medical department. Probably. Someone who can heal the kids because this sounds so, so terrifying. I thought Free Solo was scary enough, but now we've got clashing together. Like All the other stuff was scary, mm -hmm. but now there's also a time thing of, oh, and by the way, if you aren't fast enough going up the shaking, boulder-dropping, lava-spraying wall, the walls are going to smash together. Like, great. Love it. Cool. A wall sandwich with me meat in the middle. Not great. <laughs> Yeah, be an excellent climber or get smushed like a pancake. Those are your options. If I was at this camp, I would look at the cost benefit of this and I'd say best case scenario, I do the thing. Worst case scenario, I die. I think I'll stick to canoeing, please. Yeah. <laughs> Especially if you're Percy. Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. So Annabeth says that she has training and must go, but that dinner is at 7.30 and just follow his cabin to the mess hall. Percy then tries to apologize for the toilets, saying it wasn't my fault, but then he immediately realizes this was a thousand percent my fault. <laughs> yeah, dude, that's all on you. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely better phrasing he could have said. I didn't mean to do that, but it certainly was your fault. The narrator Percy says, quote, I'd made water shoot out of the bathroom fixtures. I didn't understand how, but the toilets had responded to me. I had become one with the plumbing, <laughs> which is so good. And I already talked about in a previous episode, wanting a little needlepoint that says I am supreme lord of the bathroom in my bathroom. I would also like one that says the toilets have responded to me or I became one with the plumbing. <laughs> Yes, one with the plumbing is my favorite. There's all those non-fun ways to try to politely say you're going to the bathroom, nature's calling, use the facilities, whatever. I think the new phrase we should all take going forward is, I'm sorry, I need to step out for a minute. I need to become one with the plumbing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but you can only use that euphemism if you are using a flushing toilet. Yes, yes, yes. I have lots of experience with non-flushing toilets and mm. that just wouldn't have worked. Yes, that is that is true. So Annabeth says, quote, you need to talk to the Oracle. And Percy says, who? And she says, not who, what? Mm. <laughs> the Oracle. So ominous. Yeah. I love, this is a common theme of just Percy either A, asking questions of what is happening, or B, him just asking the wrong questions. And everyone 
not dismissing him in the way of you should know this, but very matter of factly just letting him know you're wrong about this. Here's the correct answer. <laughs> yeah, I love tropes in fantasy where it's you have to be asking the right questions to learn what you want. And otherwise, people will just answer the wrong question that you just asked. Yeah, it feels like the type of careful nature you need to speak with a genie so that you don't get the wrong wish. You have to phrase the question exactly perfectly. Otherwise, they'll respond with a technicality answer. Mm-hmm. So Percy then stares into the lake and he is is wishing that someone would just give him a straight answer for once, which I love. I love that he finally expressed frustration towards people being indirect towards him. I understand it as a writing device, but I also like that Rick has the foresight to recognize this is still frustrating for our main character who asks a lot of questions, which I personally love. But yeah, it would be annoying to ask a lot and people just either give you non-answers or technicality answers that don't answer the question you've actually asked. He's been through so much. His mom is gone. He got attacked. He's in this new place, new people. Like, it's a lot. Just answer his questions. Right? Destroy the Minotaur, etc. Just a regular day. Became Supreme Lord of the Bathroom. Your regular Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Now, I also realize here that it has to be so much fun for Rick to write the frustratingly coy dialogue and then also critique the frustratingly coy characters that he's made. I absolutely love it. And this has come up in discussions, and we touched on this a little bit in the last episode, but because Rick is a former teacher. I don't remember if it was grade school or high school, but because he has taught teens in the past, that must be why he is so adept at writing in a believable teen voice Mm -hmm. and not like an adult saying, hello, fellow teens. But Percy genuinely does talk like a 12 year old. And it's got to just come from Rick's experience. And I love that he's able to adapt and translate his life into the story in a way that is fun, but still feels like a well-written story, not necessarily a sixth grader reading a book report to you. Yeah, this is a masterclass, I think, in YA writing, Mm because you can very easily get into the headset of this 12-year-old main character boy. He's very talented. Good job, Rick. Yeah, I think it's a good balancing of Percy's narration thoughts, Percy's quotes, and then quotes from the other people. You can use these other characters to sound more profound, which is a little harder to do when you're using a first-person narrator like Percy is as opposed to other YA books that are either written in third person or a a different narrator. So I agree. I think it truly is a masterclass. Percy then notices that he has the attention of naiads. And I'm very glad you're on this episode because when I read this, I asked myself, what? (laughs) Are they similar to sirens? Are they like nymphs? What is a naiad, Dr. Moya? They are nymphs. Okay. There are lots of nature nymphs in mythology. Water nymphs are naiads. Tree nymphs or wood nymphs are dryads. The nymphs who follow Dionysus around are like maenads. There are lots of ads in Greek mythology. Okay, okay. Annabeth says that these naiads are flirts. Does that hold true with what you know from mythology, or is that Annabeth just not liking naiads particularly? I can see this being a classic example of a young woman, Annabeth, not maybe understanding that rumors get spread about other women that tarnish their reputation. I feel like there are a lot of examples in Greek mythology of naiads and other nymphs being taken advantage of by the gods, which you can see in chapter seven. There's this line where the dryads, the wood nymphs, are running very quickly. And there's this throwaway line that Rick says, oh, they just had a lot of experience running away from Zeus before. I was just like, oh, Oh, my God, that's such a a veiled way of talking about the harassment that was so common in Greek mythology. So I don't think that naiads are like sleuths. Cool. Good to know. I would hope that maybe Annabeth can grow beyond it, much like Paramore no longer sings Misery Business because that is also a woman-hating song, which is unfortunate that we never get to hear that live anymore. But you got to do it. I'm still pushing for Paramore to rewrite that song just to be a very woman positive song and then we can all jam to the same beat everything in the same you know find a way to rewrite it because god that song is so good (laughs) (laughs) so jammable it's just a perfect 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 song aside from the woman hating elements but musically perfect Percy after this with the naiads says I just want to go home and Annabeth says well you are home this is the only safe place for people like us And Percy says, mentally disturbed kids. And Annabeth says, half humans. And he says, half human, half what? And she says, I think you know. And then narrator Percy goes, I was afraid I did. (laughs) (laughs) Which is a great back and forth. I don't know if mentally disturbed is the best phrasing. Yeah, I think that didn't age very well. Yes. I liked that exchange. That was the only part where I was like, eh. 
I don't know about that. But what are you going to do? It was 2005. It was 2005. And I'm pretty sure Rick has has moved beyond this. And I'm excited to see how mental health gets addressed in later books in the universe and the mm. Rick Riordan Presents universe, all that kind of stuff. So Percy then says it to Annabeth. He says, half God. And Annabeth confirms that his father isn't dead. He's an Olympian. And when Percy thinks, well, that doesn't make sense, she politely reminds him that God's absolutely love to get busy on Earth, baby. (laughs) I'm very interested to see, I know you just mentioned the throwaway line, but I am interested to see, I don't know if the gods actually show up in person in this book at all. I would hope that the book does address how much of a problem people like Zeus are with this behavior, because so far we have gotten examples of how often they do it just in given how many Hermes kids there are and stuff like that. I would hope that the book addresses this head on at some point, or at least the series does, but I don't know. Oh, Oh, no. Oh, Oh, no. (laughs) I don't want to spoil it. (laughs) It's all good. We'll talk about it when I have Rick on the pod eventually. Rick, come on the pod. So Annabeth tells him that the preferred terms are demigod or half-blood. PJ then asks who her dad is, and she goes, wow, sexist much? Why couldn't it be my mom? Which, good point, good on you, fantastic. So apparently her mom is cabin six, meaning that her mother is Athena. She is the goddess of wisdom and the goddess of battle, which is very cool. I'm a big Athena fan, so I appreciate that Annabeth, who is very much set up to be a long-standing character, the fact that she is a daughter of Athena, I think, is very cool. Oh, yeah. Athena has always been my favorite. Yeah. And so when I met Annabeth reading this for the first time and learned that she was Athena's daughter, she was my top choice <laughs> for characters in the novel. That's great. What about Athena sparked your interest? Is it just the combination of wisdom, but also I will beat you up? Yeah, like she's a smart woman who's also, you know, this dope fighter. Like that's just a great combination. And I had a hard time relating to Percy when I was reading this for the first time because oh. I was annoyingly always the best student. I just related more to Annabeth than I did to PJ. Uh, <laughs> Totally makes sense. Totally makes sense. I feel like Independent Women by Destiny's Child could have been written about Athena. (laughs) (laughs) I think that's for sure. There's something that you mentioned about relating to Percy, and I wanted to ask you about it. Someone mentioned this on Twitter, and I hadn't heard it, but I think it's an interesting theory. In all of the artistic renditions, and then I know the, the casting of Percy in the movies, he's white. But someone said, you should talk about how there is at least a fan theory of Percy being coded as a black character. And I don't know if that's something you've ever heard or if you agree with. Obviously, I am white, so I can't talk from any sort of experience here. But I didn't know if that was something you had noticed or picked up on or if this was also new to you. And this is a podcast, so you can't see us. Right. I am not white. <laughs> <laughs> I am a half black woman and I never got that impression. Okay. I never heard that fan theory and I didn't see that reading through this. But one thing that you won't get to until you get to the movie, which hot take, I did not mind. There are characters who I guess people might assume are white from the books, but the actors are black in the movie. That's good. Mm -hmm. The only thing I really know about the movies is that they're terrible. (laughs) If they've at least gone with just not all white casting... That's one plus. Hooray! (laughs) At least there's that. Okay, cool. Well, we'll see if anyone else brings this up. But yeah, just someone mentioned it on Twitter. I thought it was interesting. It is interesting. So when Annabeth said that her mother was Athena, I recognized something that Clarice had said earlier that now makes sense. Clarice called her wise girl. So that makes sense of, ah, wise girl, wisdom, etc. And it did clarify that when she says wise girl, it wasn't like a mob mafia thing of a wise girl, but no, (laughs) literally a wise girl, not a wise girl. Although I could imagine that Clarice being the daughter of Ares, like maybe has some mafia connections. Maybe it's both. (laughs) Yeah, Clarice in our fan theory is very Italian. Mm -hmm. Annabeth says that Percy's dad is still undetermined and that he needs to wait for a sign from him and he will make a sign to claim Percy. And we will see about that soon. For reference, I have read up to chapter eight, so uh, we'll see what happens there. So she says that it happens sometimes, and Percy asks sometimes, and Annabeth says the gods are busy, they have a lot of kids, and they don't always, well, they don't, well, sometimes they don't care about us, Percy. They ignore us. And that's just an absolute gut punch Mm -hmm. that just really kind of puts into perspective 
how strange the position that these kids are in truly is. Yeah. Half of it's cool. Whoa, my dad or mom is an Olympian. That's fantastic. I have magical powers. On the other half, my dad might be too busy because he has too many kids that he doesn't want to claim me. That sucks. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I love that Annabeth is the one to see that. It feels very in line with her wise girl aesthetic. Yeah, for sure. And then Percy relates to this. It reminds him of the kids at Yancey with parents who are too busy to deal with their kids and they just dump them off at this boarding school, which is a real thing that happens. And Mm -hmm. it sucks that Percy can relate to this on both fronts. But thankfully, his mom is great. And I really hope she's not dead. (laughs) I hope there's a way Percy can get her back because Sally Jackson is just too pure. And I don't know if I'll be emotionally okay if she doesn't come back in the story at some point. Agreed. When I read that for the first time, the scene where she just like disappears into light, I think I had to put the book down and cry. <laughs> I was just like, what? His mom died? It's the first chapter. It just shows the writing prowess of Rick is that we knew about her for six pages and we're already incredibly crestfallen when she melts into golden light or whatever. Yeah. So Percy asks if being at the camp is permanent, and Annabeth says it depends. Some kids only stay for the summer because they aren't incredibly strong. So people who are the descendants of Aphrodite and Demeter are given as examples. And apparently the monsters won't focus on them, so they only really need one summer's worth of training to fend off any potential monsters that come their way. But other kids attract monsters, and they become year-rounders. So apparently monsters wait until kids are 10 or 11. Very convenient for the purpose of our story. I've read exactly two YA series in Harry Potter and now Percy Jackson. Is there just a universal standard? Are there the Ten Commandments of YA novels where it says your (laughs) character must be 10 or 11? I mean, I guess Hunger Games is in and Twilight is in and that's... But they're Similar. close. Yeah. Uh, is it just because target demographics of kids for these books is 10 or 11 that they decide, yeah, it's got to be that? Yeah, absolutely. They want the readers to be able to age up with the characters in the books. Mm-hmm. I've always explained it in my head as, oh, magical stuff, magical abilities. They just kick in when you reach puberty. Ah. <laughs> so that's why nothing happens when you're a little kid. Very kind of the monsters. They wait until they're 10 or 11 and then they bounce. <laughs> I guess it would make more sense if they clarify as you don't emit the musk that attracts monsters until you're 10 or 11. I realize that was the worst possible phrasing, (laughs) but that's not how it was explained, at least by Annabeth. So I thought it was just an interesting turn of phrase. And it doesn't really get explained, I don't think. Nah, it doesn't have to. It doesn't have to. It's a Y series. We don't need to ask questions. So Annabeth says that monsters cannot arrive at camp unless they are summoned, which happens for practice fights and practical jokes. (laughs) Feels like not a great system. Feels like summoning it should be harder if Mm -hmm. practical jokes is one of the ways in which this happens. Not great. But also, I am not at all surprised because Camp Half-Blood seems like the type of place where they kind of want all of the campers to be in mortal danger all the time. Yeah, I mean, it is a training facility, so it feels like the big overarching mantra is what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. It's all in the purpose of training, but also feels like a cop-out for just having a poorly run camp. (laughs) But she notes that the border around the camp is designed to keep mortals and monsters out. It just appears to be a strawberry farm to anyone that isn't supposed to be at the camp, which I think it's nice. Another classic YA trope. And now if I'm ever in upstate New York and I pass a strawberry field, I will be very intrigued. I thought it was on Long Island. Yes. When I say when I say upstate New York, I just mean not the city. <laughs> I'm very guilty of calling anything that is not New York City, upstate New York. It is Long Island. <laughs> It's just like patently to the east. It's not even north. Right. Maybe this is because I'm from New Jersey and you always say that you're going down the shore when you're talking about the Jersey Mm -hmm. Shore, even if you're coming from the south or central Jersey. So I guess in my brain, just directions don't actually mean directions. They just mean away from a particular location. And directions are a social construct. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Compasses are also a flat circle. (laughs) So Annabeth confirms that she is a year rounder after Percy asks what she is and she shows a necklace that looks just like our friend Luke's, but it also has a gold ring on it, like a college ring. And I think this is classic Texas Uncle Rick showing up because I went to college in Texas and Texas loves their all gold. Look at me. I went to college rings. It's a really big thing there. Texas A&M has these really 
and I'm just going to be honest, and Everett and A&M, you're kidding yourselves if you don't agree. They are absolutely gaudy rings. They are <laughs> enormous. It's like a watch on your finger. They are so big. Is it like a Super Bowl ring? It's not that obnoxious, but it is the biggest possible ring before you can get to Super Bowl ring. Okay. It's quite large. And there's this ring dunk ceremony at Texas A&M where you get a pitcher of beer and you drop the ring in it. You have to chug the pitcher and then get the ring. Feels like that could lead to accidental ring consumption. Feels yeah. like not ideal. At Rice, where I I went, they just give you your ring, which I appreciated. And I still have it, even though I've, I am surprised I have not lost this thing. It was right there next to you. But I'm always worried that I'm going to lose it. But yeah, Texas A&M has rings. UT has rings. Rice has rings. It's a big thing. So for Rick to bring some Texas into the mix, I am not surprised. So she says she's been at the camp since she was seven and campers get a bead on their necklace every August and she has been there longer than most counselors. So kind of sad, but hey, cool necklace. Woo. I feel like they don't explain whether Annabeth is there for so long because she has a really powerful mom. Like, is her aura just too strong mm-hmm. and monsters would attack her? Or is it because her dad is just kind of like neglectful. Yeah, they haven't really gotten into it. I don't know if they will get into it later, but it does feel like a bit of a mystery, perhaps that we will revisit later. We know that she's been here for a while, and it does seem confusing that she's been here since such an early age. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if we will revisit uh, what's going on with AB. PJ asks why she came here so young, and Annabeth, as we've just referenced, she says, none your business. (laughs) When I read that, I thought, ah, we will get to this later. This is certainly going to come up. You don't write that in unless we're going to revisit it. So Percy asks if he could leave if he wanted, and Annabeth says, yeah, but that wouldn't be a wise decision, and Mr. D and Chiron need to give you permission to do so. It only happens at the end of the summer unless you get assigned a quest, but that hardly ever happens, which I thought, "Mm, but Percy Jackson's the main character of a (laughs) five-book series, I... I feel like an exception will be made for him. (laughs) Yeah, that line was a gun on a mantle if ever I saw one. (laughs) So she starts to mention a last time there was a quest, but then kind of trails off. And there are so many seeds that have been planted that haven't grown yet. I have notes of them. So I should keep a running list of there's the thing that Grover messed up that we already kind of learned about it. But we don't know why Annabeth is here so long. We don't know what happened on this last quest. There's so many things that they've kind of hinted at. Who's the person in the attic that Percy felt like he definitely saw in the window that Chiron said no one's in the attic? Not a living thing. Yeah, I, That was so suspicious, man. <laughs> that is such that is so much more of an answer than nothing. Right? That is a big old technicality thing. There's a lot of little things uh, that's going to happen. But I, especially someone who likes to try to predict what happens next, I love this. And I'm super on board. So Percy brings up Annabeth mentioning the summer solstice when feeding him ambrosia. And again, this is one of those seeds. We had the summer solstice and the winter solstice talked about between Chiron and Grover. Mm -hmm. Now we had it again with Annabeth. So she says that, oh, you do know something. But he explains, no, I just overheard Grover and Chiron mentioning it. (laughs) And then you said it. And I'm good at remembering key phrases that... Stand out to me. I don't really know anything. Right. I just have ears and a brain. It's, it's fine. <laughs> I just have ears, a brain, and a memory. Please don't hold this against me. I'm still very confused. Tell me what's happening. <laughs> so she says that Chiron and the satyrs know what's up, but won't tell her. Something is wrong with Olympus. Even though last time she was there, it looked normal. Hmm. <laughs> So Percy is shocked that she's ever been there, and she says the year-rounders like her and Luke and Clarice went during the winter solstice, when the gods have their big annual council. So A, very cool. B, I'm sure we're going to get a winter solstice at some point, and I'm very excited about it. Oh, yeah. So Percy asks, how do you get there? And I love this answer. This is great. Annabeth says, quote, the Long Island Railroad, of course. You get off at Penn Station, (laughs) Empire State Building, special elevator to the 600th floor. I just love it. And then narrator Percy continues, she looked at me like she was sure I must know this already. And then she says, quote, you are a New Yorker, right? (laughs) God, so good. That is so good. So good. That's on all the New York guides. Just go to the 600th floor of the Empire State (laughs) Building. You'll go right to Olympus. It's really good. And I do appreciate, I'm trying to do New York watch of Rick. And this is pretty accurate. Penn Station is maybe a five to 10 minute walk from the Empire State Building. It's not connected. So she didn't mention anything about you do have to get out and then walk to the Empire State Building. But I do think it's pretty cool that the Long Island Rail 
road just would take you there, which is great. Love the Lear. It's good in a pinch, especially if you got to go to Long Island. I wonder what stop Camp Half Flood is on the Long Island Railroad. I bet it's got some like vaguely Greek name where mm. the people understand what it is, but other people go, oh, Things in New York have strange names all the time. There's a bridge in New York called the Spoiten Doivel Bridge. It is very <laughs> Dutch. So they could probably just have some sort of, you know, it's like Chiron Avenue or something. And everyone's like, oh, OK, yeah, sure. Whatever. New Yorkers aren't going to question it. Yeah. <laughs> like, what does Bedford Stuyvesant mean? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, we just don't question the names. <laughs> Not at all. Zero times. Annabeth explains that right after visiting, the weather got very strange, as if the gods had started fighting. Ooh! She thinks that something important was stolen, and if it's not returned by the summer solstice, there will be trouble. So I feel like that is a very specific of, I don't really know what's going on, but if I had to guess, I think they're fighting and something was stolen. It feels very specific, maybe because she's been around so long, this is a recurring thing, but I just did think it was funny to go from, I don't know what's happening, I have a really good inclination, though. <laughs> <laughs> she is Athena's daughter, True. so maybe it's just not in her nature to not know things. But even when she has an idea, she'll still say, oh, I don't know, because her standards for knowing something are just so high. Yeah, and maybe her perception is just really good. She's mm -hmm. just got a really good sense of, well, if there's weird weather, it means they're fighting and they only fight when stuff gets stolen, et cetera, et cetera. Annabeth continues that when Percy arrived, she hoped that they could work together and he might know something. She mentions Athena gets along with everyone except for Ares and has a rivalry with Poseidon. Now, I wrote in my notes real big here, uh-oh, because <laughs> at this point, I was very convinced that the father of Percy Jackson was Poseidon. I put my stakes in for this claim very early, and uh, we will discuss whether or not I'm right in the next chapter. But I was very worried when she said that. But of course, of course, they would have some sort of rivalry. Classic Romeo and Juliet for these characters that either will be best friends or love interest. I am not yet sure which direction it will go, but I would be happy with either direction. Now, Percy smells barbecue smoke and his stomach growls. And honestly, mine did too when I was reading this because the food they described sounds so, so good. <laughs> so good. <laughs> Annabeth tells him to head over for dinner. So back at Cabin 11, Luke tells Percy that he got him a sleeping bag and toiletries. And he notices that all the kids have similar smiles and look like the type to be pegged as troublemakers. And then <laughs> Percy recognizes, oh, right, they all have the same dad. <laughs> this makes sense. <laughs> so Percy asks Luke if he has ever met his dad. And Luke says that there was only one time he did. And then Percy leaves space for him to share the story if he wanted to. But then Luke doesn't, so Percy doesn't press him on it, which we love this. Mm -hmm. A respectful king. Very well done, Thank Percy. You. Finally. Yes. You leave the space of, I'm not going to push here, but if they want to talk about it, they will. And if they don't, I'm not going to say anything. Love that inclination. Whereas there's other YA characters that probably would have been like, what happened? <laughs> So I like that he's got the social understanding to not do this. Percy, as the narrator, does say, quote, I wondered if the story had anything to do with how he got his scar. And then I immediately thought of the Dark Knight of, you want to know how I got these scars? <laughs> Luke assures Percy that most of the campers are good people and they look out for each other. They're all extended family after all, which makes sense. Mm -hmm. I have zero cousins, though, so I have no concept of... If cousins all get along, how it relates to brothers, sisters, none of my aunts and uncles had kids. Oh. So I am not well versed in extended family, but my wife has lots of cousins and I have grasped different things, especially when we had to pick which cousins get invited to the wedding. Oh, no. Thankfully, Kelly has just enough but not too many where we had to make some cuts. But I have certainly heard some of my friends having to draw the line at particular cousins, and that seems stressful. Yeah, I'm in that stage of wedding planning now. <laughs> oh, no! So you're doing guestless stuff? Mm -hmm. It's the worst, because you know what you get to do? You know what you have to do? Rank your friends! Yes. Sucks so much! I have to remember how much each person's food will cost, and then put a price tag on all of my favorite people in the world. It is the worst, and then you have to do things of, of, well, if I invite this person, then I also have to do this. That was where when it came time for me inviting podcasters, I invited people from multitude. And then I was like, I can't invite anyone else that's in podcasting because if I invite this person, then I got to do this. There's just like the waterfall effect of people that you invite and it's the worst and I hate it. And before, if I ever didn't get invited to a wedding of a friend I thought was close enough where I should have got invited, I used to get sad. Now that I've put one together, 
I completely understand. It is so stressful of like, well, if I invite this coworker, I have to invite four more because they're all in the same tier of French. Yeah. It sucks so much. Same thing with picking your wedding party. It's the worst, but also to make you feel better about it, I think everyone will understand no matter what decision is made. And then sometimes you also do have to factor in like intentional over-inviting. And then sometimes people will RSVP no, and then you get to have the little subtle fist pump of, yeah, good. Now I don't feel bad about either inviting or not inviting this other person. <laughs> Fun stuff. Yay! <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> Wedding planning tangent, super relevant. Here, let's end this on a positive advice note that Kelly and I did that I think everyone should do. Instead of numbering our tables, we named our tables after cities that were important to us in our relationship. So mm -hmm. that way, no one was like, oh, I'm at table 12. Instead, it was, oh, I'm at table Seattle. Cool. I would highly recommend, and anyone can steal this idea, to either make your tables not numbers or make them random numbers. We were maybe going to do numbers that were important to us or something. Do things that aren't just sequential because then no one can be upset. And then the other thing we did that is unrelated, our guest book was a tear by day calendar. And then people wrote on days. So then the whole next year, we got to tear away days and, and people said nice stuff. This was my two in the morning idea that I jotted down on my phone that turned out to be fantastic. According to Kelly and all of her friends, they were like, Mike thought of this? I ever thought it was Kelly's <laughs> idea because she's a genius with that kind of stuff. But it was also very cool because our entire year after our wedding, since we got married, February 29th of 2020, was quarantine. Oh, my God. So yeah. So since we didn't get to see friends for a year, it was cool to read nice things from friends for a year. It worked out super well. Okay. Now that we've concluded wedding talk, we can continue with the rest of chapter seven. <laughs> little interlude. Brief wedding interlude. Honestly, this is probably where I will take the ad break. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to the lightning brief for episode five. First, in an earlier episode of The New Olympian, I was talking about Mr. Brunner using his wheelchair, and I referred to him as a wheelchair-bound professor. I used this turn of phrase because that is what was in the book. That was the exact text. It said, my wheelchair-bound professor, but some helpful folks reached out and let me know that this type of terminology is outdated. A more apt description would have been to say that Mr. Brunner is a wheelchair user or he is in a wheelchair, not necessarily that he's bound, because that can imply he is always using his wheelchair, which is just not the case. I didn't realize that what the book had was was outdated. I appreciate everyone who reached out. And just for posterity, I went and edited the old episode and re-uploaded it so that it no longer says that. But I wanted to make it public and not just secretly do this to act like, oh, look at me. I knew this from the beginning because I didn't. And I'm glad people corrected me on this and I learned from it. And maybe now some of you can as well. And speaking of people helping me out, we have so many people supporting the show on Patreon. If you go to the newstolympian.com slash Patreon, you can support the show and get access to bonus content. Right now, I've been putting up some audio content content, and soon we will develop the stickers and the pins and the physical merchandise, but I want to let the show go a little bit more so we can get some jokes to shape what those designs might be as opposed to just being the logo or something like that. But I am continuing through my wonderful problem of so many people supported the show before it launched that I had to break it up into multiple episodes. So here are 50 more people who have joined at the God tier. Shout out to Florian Seitz, Ruby Highland, Taylor, Rachel Washart, Ashley Lynn, Dyslexic Demigod, Anna Tullis, Lauren Rowell, Mackenzie Wolfram, Kimberly, Andy, Victoria Ellers, Nash Sonadiki, Tyler Grubbs, Tim Ten Have, Rebecca L, Look, A Clara, Thomas Sullivan, Kaz Molden, Emma Webb, Patrick Zagetti, Louise McQuaid, Amy Goff, Emma Il Oscar. Thomason, Jackie McGinnis, Steph, Michaela Veneer, Tori Hallsworth, Fine Tuning Nonsense, Zeki, Shay Brachel, Night Fury, Abby Dryberg, Katie Bell, Lauren Boyan, Lydia Oliveri, Emily, Alex Waring, Hannah Wishnu, Lindsay Holt, Jess Schmid, Matt Cobb, Chelsea, Emmy Lee Lillo, Alexandra Jens, Carlos Granados, Neku, Gabby B, Juliana Johnson, and someone that made their username the first many digits of Pi, so 3.14159265358979323284. Six four three three eight three two seven nine five zero two eight eight four one nine seven one six nine three nine nine three seven five one zero five eight two zero nine seven four nine four four five nine two three zero seven eight one six four zero six two eight six two zero eight nine nine eight six two eight oh three four eight two five three four two one one seven zero six seven nine and I didn't edit that I promise that was all one take. <laughs> 
Also shout out to Diana Kim, who joined at the Super God tier, Alexa, who joined at the Mega God tier, and our newest Ultra Gods, our newest producer level patrons, Shannon Ivanez Aguilar and Wise Girl. Thank you all so much for supporting, and if you want to join the Patreon team, head on over to the newestolympian.com slash Patreon. And speaking of support, we have a sponsor for this episode, and that sponsor is Shaker and Spoon. If you want to make Dionysus proud, you really want to show off your prowess, you're going to need to learn how to make cocktails. And if you don't know how to make cocktails, Shaker and Spoon can be your personal mixologist. Shaker and Spoon is a delivery service that sends you a box of all of the ingredients and instructions on how to make four servings of three different drinks, all using the same liquor. All you do is provide the booze, they provide everything else, and these things will include fresh fruit, or particular syrups, or Coco Lopez, a whole bunch of fun stuff that you can make, and they have a promotion going on right now. This episode is coming out in October, and they have a promotion going on called Mezcaloween, which, uh, if that doesn't make you want to sign up, I don't know what will, but I've had a great time with Shaker and Spoon. It's a fun way to make drinks if you're having friends over or if you just don't want to deal with cocktail bar prices. It's a good time. And because you are a listener of the newest Olympian, you can get $20 off your first box if you go to shakerandspoon.com slash TNO. You'll get $20 off and the boxes run between 40 and 50 bucks. So that's about half off, which is a good deal. So head on over to shakerandspoon.com slash TNO and you can get some sweet, tasty stuff delivered to you to make some fun drinks today. And also just want to thank Multitude for having us as a part of the collective. Multitude has a whole bunch of fun shows, and I host some of them, and one of the ones I co-host is called Horse. It is a basketball podcast that is just about the entertaining elements of the sport, so if you're seeing people tweet out memes and stuff about the WNBA or the NBA or both on Twitter and you're confused, Horse can teach you about how to appreciate basketball, even if you don't care about sports that much. I co-host the show with my buddy Adam Amawala, and each episode we talk about current NBA wild things happening, like Twitter beefs and player drama, and then also we talk about things from NBA history. We've done interviews with comedians and people involved in sports reporting. I'm very biased, but I think it's a fantastic show. There's a whole bunch of episodes that you can listen to right now if you search for Horse wherever you get your podcasts or go to our website, horsehoops.com. And before I go, you're about to hear words from some sponsors supporting the show, also keeping it going, making it feasible for me to do this as a job. They are locally inserted. So if you live in Japan, don't be surprised if you hear a Japanese ad. And once those ads are done, we'll get back to this episode of The Newest Olympian. We're back. So Percy asks Luke about what has been bothering him. Clarice is joking that Percy is not big three material and Annabeth saying that Percy isn't the one like Neo. (laughs) So Luke says, "Ugh, I hate prophecies and then explains since his trip to the Garden of Hesperides went sour. Chiron hasn't allowed any more quests. What is the Garden of Hesperides? Unless it's a spoiler in the book? I don't think it's a spoiler in the book. Okay. The Garden of Hesperides is where Hera's orchard of golden apple trees lives. It was one of Zeus's wedding gifts to Hera. And going to get one of these apples was one of Heracles's or Hercules's 12 labors. Oh, that is very cool. Mm-hmm. It's guarded by a dragon that never sleeps. Oh, all right. Interesting. I mean, not a big Zeus fan here because I know he's a problem and a half. Oh, yeah. That's a cool gift. If someone said, I got you an orchard, even if it's just a regular orchard, but a golden apple orchard with a dragon watchdog, mm-hmm. pretty cool gift. <laughs> yeah. And these apples, they have dope powers. The apple of discord that started the Trojan War was one of these golden apples. Whoa. What does the apple of discord do? In the story of the Trojan War, it starts because the goddess of discord, she asks a question. She's trying to figure out which of the Greek goddesses is the most beautiful, and it's Africa. Aphrodite, Athena, and someone else. Mm -hmm. They get into a fight, but the apple is the thing that like causes everyone to get all tense and their emotions Uh get high and they start fighting. It's very interesting to hear Discord be associated with a bad thing because my only knowledge of Discord, the app, is just (laughs) the thing I use for the patron stuff. And it's just everyone being really nice all the time. (laughs) Like that's where the people are just like doing digital book club for the newest Olympian. So it's funny to be like, my brain says Discord, ah, fun place for nerds. But now Discord is, oh no, everyone's talking smack about each other. And they're talking about who's the prettiest. (laughs) 
<laughs> so Chiron has not allowed any more quests since this trip went sour. Annabeth keeps pestering Chiron, and he says that he knows her fate, and he figured this out via the Oracle, and said that she couldn't go on a quest until someone special came to the camp. And mm. basically, Annabeth, with every new person that comes to the camp, she is wondering, is this the person? Is this the person? So Percy became one of those potential savior types. Mm -hmm. So just as Luke says that they should go to dinner, there is a loud conch shell horn. Is it conch or conch? In the Bahamas, they say conch. Oh, okay. And they have a lot of the shells there, so I would trust them to know how it's pronounced. Yes, I would do that as well. I'm just going to Google. Ah, Google says conch. It's funny. They've phonetically spelled it K-A-A-N-G-K, which is very fun. Let's hear what this sounds like. This is becoming a recurring bit on the pod. Let's see how Google says conch. Conch shell. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I do appreciate that they write it out phonetically and not in the IPA thing because it's funny when you go on Wikipedia where they say, here's the word, and then in parentheses, it's here's how to pronounce it. And then it's it's like Greek. <laughs> Oh, you don't know how to pronounce this word? Well, now here's the thing that you can't read <laughs> that's supposed to tell you. Thanks a lot. What a terribly flawed system. <laughs> if we were all just linguists, <laughs> then we would know what these phonemes are. Gosh, looking back in my collegiate career where I was a mechanical engineering major that is now a professional book critic. <laughs> a professional grown man reading books. Professional boy that talks about children's books. It's so funny of all the electives that I was thinking of taking but decided that's not going to be relevant. One of those classes I could have taken was linguistics and I thought I'm not going to need to do this. I'm an engineer. What do I need to know about how language works? <laughs> oh boy, would have been helpful. <laughs> that's karma for you. It truly, truly is. This also happened in high school. My language options, I grew up in New Jersey. I moved to Texas right before high school. And the Spanish classes were intimidating because Ooh. Texas takes Spanish very seriously. When I was in K-8 school in New Jersey, we had Spanish class once a week. So I was not prepared. So from that point, my options were Latin or French. And I thought... When am I going to ever need to learn French? I'm not going to need to do that. And then in my engineering work, they sent me on a six-month work thing to France. So that would have helped. But taking Latin in high school, it has paved a long way. Because now I know some of the stuff in this story. Hmm. I feel like it probably helps a little bit with the linguistics, too. A little bit. It certainly at least helped with the SATs, which I needed because I was good at the math. But the other stuff needed some work. Shout out to Latin. <laughs> <laughs> so just as Luke says that they should go to dinner, he hears the conch shell, horn, and Luke tells cabin 11 to fall in. So all 20 fill into the commons. The campers come out from the other cabins, except for cabin 8, which looked normal in the daytime, but now glows silver in the night. And I was very confused of who this cabin was. I was kind of process of eliminating it, thinking maybe it's the Hades one, but that feels weird. Maybe it's the Artemis one, because I feel like she's goddess of the hunt, and sometimes it's the moon, so maybe normal in day, but now it's night, but they don't say it. We'll just have to see who Kevin Eight is. The satyrs arrive, the naiads arrive, and then it says, quote, a few other girls came out of the woods. And when I say out of the woods, I mean straight out of the woods. I saw one girl about nine or 10 years old melt from the side of a maple tree and come <laughs> skipping up the hill. I need to know everything about this character. Who is this girl? I hope she's one of the spinoff books because melting out of a tree that's amazing. I love that she skips up the hill. Like yes! She must do this every day, and she's still so enamored with this place that she skips up the hill to dinner time. To be so powerful that you can do something so cool and then have no reaction. It's like in any sport when someone hits a game winner and then they don't celebrate. That's mm. almost cooler than any celebration. If you're so cold-blooded, you have such ice in your veins, zero-degree Kelvin veins, <laughs> that you can... Hit a game winner and then just stare. Whoa. So yes, the only way to one up it then would be to either melt out of the side of a tree or hit a game winner and then skip. Hell yeah. <laughs> like that's super cool. Yeah. That's a big power move. Huge, huge, huge power move. BDE, big dryad energy. <laughs> Amazing. Gosh. If we didn't title these about whatever the chapter was, that would be the title of this episode. <laughs> So in total, there's about a hundred campers and a few dozen satyrs and a dozen wood nymphs and naiads. And I thought because of the conch shell that this was some sort of emergency, but this is just dinner. I thought that this was some, they blow a horn. I thought, oh no, someone's going to attack. We just talked about people getting summoned in. Someone's clearly been summoned. And then, nah, this is just what they do for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Have you never been to a camp? 
Have you never heard like a big horn or something calling you to dinner? The only camps I ever did in the summer were sports camps. I was a big mainstay of Mercer County Community College tennis camp, and we would just play tennis in the morning. And then at noon, you would just go to the cafeteria of the college. And then I would get a pork roll and cheese sandwich. And my buddy Josh would get a chicken cheese steak. And then we would eat those, buy some sort of candy of sorts. And then we would watch a movie while it was the hottest part of the day. And then you would play tennis the rest of the day. There was no conch shell. There was the guy in charge of the camp yelling loudly saying that it was time to eat lunch. So That's I the guess same. the vocal cord equivalent of a conch shell. <laughs> but no one told us to fall in. Mm. <laughs> no one melted out of a tree. <laughs> <laughs> no one is melting out of trees in New Jersey. There aren't enough trees. I will defend suburban New Jersey. There's some good trees. Central Jersey, okay. where I lived, we had a good repertoire of trees. Oh, okay. I will defend Central Jersey at all times. So Luke instructs Percy to speak to his empty glass and it will fill with whatever he wants. And he says, and I already am relating to Percy a lot, but when I was a kid, my favorite soda was Cherry Coke. And he says Cherry Coke, but then he goes, oh, wait, Blue Cherry Coke. And then the soda. And this is very important to me as former podcaster with Potterless because I thought it was very funny when the night bus was first described, a purple bus, they described it as violently purple. The book says, quote, the soda turned a violent shade of cobalt. Mm. And now I'm very excited that we can carry over. We had violently purple in the past. Clearly, we now have violently cobalt, just a very alarming blue. <laughs> <laughs> Are violent purple and violent cobalt the multitude colors? I am colorblind. I particularly struggle with shades of blue and purple. In the multitude logo, what I would say is purple and teal. But also, I know it's been described as purple and cyan. Cyan is one of those colors where I just don't know. It's kind of like turquoise where I think, yeah, it's kind of like blue green. And some people are like, no, it's blue. Some people are like, no, it's green. <laughs> I don't know what to think. And I'm not an authority here since I have failed every colorblind test I've ever taken. I think it's purple and teal. Okay. I don't know. Is that what you would say? That's my not properly functioning eyes. <laughs> yeah, looking at it now, I would say teal, but I feel like so many blues overlap. Right. It could be purple and turquoise. It could be purple and cyan. I do not know. I'm pretty confident that the purple is purple, though. <laughs> Is it violent, though? It could be. It's quite bright. <laughs> Cobalt, though, is distinctly royal blue, though. So we might have to say it's violently purple and violently cyan, but... <laughs> I like that violent cobalt has now made its way into the story yeah. and we can have an official color now, even though the color that I've chosen for the background of the logo of the Noose Olympian is a uh, seaish green. Again, I do this cool thing where I pick colors that I can't see properly for my podcasts, where <laughs> I picked indigo for Potterless, which is inherently the midpoint between blue and purple, which is exactly <laughs> the color that I cannot see. And this one, I know what color it is, but I, I am afraid of calling it green or blue. I don't know what's up. It's, I guess, aqua. I have no idea. I just wanted it to look like water because I knew that water was a thing. <laughs> So after Percy has his violent cobalt cherry coke, which is fantastic, Luke then hands him some smoked brisket, which, oh, so good. Very Texas of Uncle Rick here to throw brisket into the mix, but... Uncle Rick. People have told me that that is like what they call him, and I very really? much like it. Yes, I think it's great. I, I, Rick, come on the pod. Let me know if it's okay if I call you Uncle Rick, but I think it's good. I kind of want to say it anytime he does something that's cute and fun, and I think bringing out brisket, great. Super Texan, a very, at least for me, an aromatically activating food to describe because he talks about the smell, and you can't describe brisket without, to me, smelling brisket. And when I learned that you had to do a burnt offering of the best part of the brisket, that made me very sad because I think you should be able to offer, you know, broccoli, the asparagus, zucchini, the things that kids feed to their dog. Can't the gods like that? Let me eat my brisket, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, they demand only the best. Not a fan of this rule. I would have been very upset. So handsome smoked brisket. Everyone gives a burnt offering to the gods and it's the best part of each item, which feels awful. Percy agrees with me thinking that this is a completely whack decision, but you got to do what you got to do. When he gives this burnt offering, narrator Percy says, quote, it smelled nothing like burning food. It smelled of hot chocolate and fresh baked brownies, hamburgers on the grill and wildflowers, and a hundred other good things that shouldn't have gone well together, but did. I could almost believe the gods could live off that smoke. So I like that he initially went, this is weird, and then very quickly completely understands their side of it. It shows growth, and I appreciate that. Yes. 
Thank you, Percy, for this growth. So Mr. D begrudgingly gives a speech that Capture the Flag is on Friday and Cabin 5 are the current champs. That is the Ares cabin that Clarice belongs to. Mr. D also mentions that they have a new camper, <laughs> Peter Johnson, which I understand that Peter Johnson is a pretty common name. So there's certainly a non-zero chance that someone listening to this podcast right now is Peter Johnson. I am not trying to besmirch your good name, Pete. I think you're great. You're wonderful. You're probably a very nice human if you've decided to listen to this podcast. But there is just something funny about going from Percy Jackson to Peter Johnson. I don't know why, but it works so well, and it's so funny. <laughs> I love it because, you know, I read this in seventh grade. That's like the height of children's dick jokes. <laughs> And Peter Johnson, I'm sorry, Peter Johnson, Yes, if you're listening, Peter Johnson is, it's just a name that is penis penis. Yeah, it's not as bad as I did know of a human named Harold Johnson who <gasps> actively, intentionally went by the nickname Harry. You have chosen to be Harry Johnson. <laughs> what are you doing? I think what's funny about it is that Jackson's already a common name, but Johnson is a more common name. And Percy's not the most common name, but Peter is a pretty common name. So I think what makes it really funny not to besmirch the name of Peter Johnson or like you did, Dr. Moya, just say he's Dick Dick. But you could <laughs> own that, Peter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I think just to go to a even more generic name is funny. And I also know that some people colloquially refer to the Percy Jackson movies that people do not like as the Peter Johnson movie. And I think that is so good. I think that is absolutely incredible. Yeah. So I'm definitely on team calling it the Peter Johnson movie. Because <laughs> when I first heard that, that came up in the Discord and on Patreon and stuff, I thought people were just making the joke of, oh, it's similar to Percy Jackson, but it's not actually Percy Jackson. I didn't realize it was actually from the book. Deep cut reference. Yes, yeah, super, super funny. So then they go to the campfire and they make s'mores and sing songs. I love that this camp is still also a camp. <laughs> I think that's such a great element. And Percy finally feels at home, which I think is really nice. This is good, especially because he's gone through so much already. Grief and confusion and all of the bad things that have come along with this obnoxious adventure for him. But he's starting to feel a bit of comfort. And that's really nice, especially for someone who, even when his life was normal wasn't comforting and he didn't necessarily feel like he was ever at home because he kept moving schools and all of that. It's really nice. And I'm glad that he's starting to feel that even with all of the absurd circumstances surrounding him. Yeah, it's a good comforting moment for PJ. Mm -hmm. So he falls asleep, gripping the horn and thinking of his mom. Narrator Percy says, quote, when I closed my eyes, I fell asleep instantly. That was my first day at Camp Half-Blood, and I wish I'd known how briefly I would get to enjoy my new home, which, oh my God, like, <laughs> the suspense. Is so fantastic because <laughs> I know that my guess here is that his dad is Poseidon. But at this point, is Percy's dad the god of suspense? Because <laughs> Percy Jackson as the narrator is so good at dangling the carrot and giving you suspense and keeping you on the edge of your seat. He is, and I know this is Rick, but like, he is so good. He is <laughs> top tier suspense because this is the end of chapter seven and this is the end of this episode of the News Olympian. But it is so good. It's so good. And there's been a very common thing where a lot of people, which I think is awesome, have never read the Percy Jackson books, but are doing so because of this podcast. I think that's so cool. There are so many people who have already tweeted, I was planning on just reading and keeping in touch with the podcast, but oops, I'm on book four. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's so hard to put down. Like I had to force myself to stop after chapter eight because I didn't want to ruin anything. It's ridiculous. And if I wasn't doing this podcast where I intentionally try to not read ahead so that I can guess and be wrong about stuff and everyone can laugh at me. I would have been long done with this series, and especially because I recorded episodes one and two in May, and we're recording this one in September, so there was a long time where I was just sitting on only reading the first four chapters for three months? Oh, Are no. you kidding me? It was horrendous. It is so tough to put these books down, mm -hmm. and uh, I hate to do this to you all, but... That's the end of this episode. Uh-oh. Uh oh yeah. But Dr. Moya, thank you so much for lending your expertise and your love of the series. 
you will be on for the next episode about chapter eight, which is called We Capture a Flag. Really good stuff. So good. But in the meantime, if people want to find stuff that you are doing before hearing your voice again on next week's episode, where can they find you? You can find me on Twitter at GoAstroMo, and you can find my ExoLore podcast. It's ExoLore Pod. It's ExoLore wherever you get your podcasts. And it's a show where we build and analyze fictional worlds, but based on facts and science. So you'll learn, you'll laugh. And uh, if things are hard right now, it'll maybe give you a chance to escape to a different world for a while. Love that. Love that. Definitely check it out. Again, thank you for joining. Listeners, thank you for listening. And until next time, it'll be very soon for you, Moya. But for all the listeners, until next time, I, uh, I'll just perceive you when I see you, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Newest Olympian. This podcast is created, hosted, and produced by me, Mike Schubert. I also run the social media and the website. Our editor is Sherry Guo. The music is by Bettina Campamanes and Brandon Grugel, and the art is by Jessica E. Boyd. If you want to learn more about the show, you can go to our website, thenewestolympian.com. You can also go to thenewestolympian.com slash Patreon to get access to some sweet bonus content, whether that's bonus audio or eventually exclusive merchandise or access to our patron-only Discord, a whole bunch of fun stuff over there. And if you want to find us on social media, you can find us at New newest olympian on twitter instagram and facebook and at reddit.com slash r slash the newest olympian of course a huge shout out to our producer level patrons lada bartova kelsey gillespie the damn steam nuggets emma cooey vicky garcia ellie hoskovchova veronica bartova natanya page Haley hastings robin garcia frida vickstrom megan moon tough bayfong moo moo productions don't call me nymphadora olivia y craig mcroberts griffin dork taylor payne giselle salvador minka dreesen can't i seaweed brain matt barger peter johnson the twins sabrina balsiger mooney b bony pony harlan christ heather mcmillan casey canales Polly. Nikki Harris, Tatiana Schmidt, Sandra Rose, Bridget Lowry, Josh Wilkie, Martin Anvik, Abby Ryan, Josh Clements, Angela MF, Mary Baumgartner, Shannon Ivanez Aguilar, and Wise Girl. If you're enjoying the show and you want to help out non-monetarily, spreading the show via word of mouth is so helpful, especially for a new podcast. So whether you talk about it on social media or you reach out to someone directly or you leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, all of those things can really help the show. And if you decide to do any of them, thank you so much. Hopefully you enjoyed this episode and I hope you tune in next week as we continue through The Lightning Thief as we cover chapter. Eight. But again, thanks for listening, and until next time, I'll pursue you later. Bye.